I was about to go to the park and ride my bike and do all these fun things and then we get a call and it's like hurry you have to come to the hospital your brother's born and then that day I learned be careful what you ask for <laughs> um, no but in all seriousness I love my brother I would do anything for him anything to protect him just like the day that changed my life um, I remember my mom saying that she was gonna take my brother and I to go get some ice cream and she wanted to know if I wanted to go as well. I was very back and forth about it, which is weird because any kid wants to go get some ice cream. Um, I would describe that feeling now as anxiety. Then I didn't have a word for that. Um, but I ended up going, I got in the car and when we got there, she parked in front of the Taco Bell. She would be right back. Um, but, and I saw men with guns running towards my mom and they were dressed in like Hawaiian t-shirts and, and, and khaki pants and I was really confused and then the third one comes and he's in a cop uniform and I realized that my mom's getting arrested and at that time my mom was like most children their savior their person their rock you think your parents can do no wrong and all I knew to do was to crawl in the back seat with my brother and try and shield him from the things that I was seeing I don't remember much from that day. Our brains protect us in that way to let us forget a little bit of trauma. But I do remember getting to the police station and calling Ollie time and time and time again and him not answering. And I don't know what was up with his phone, but he wasn't able to get to it. And so the defects lady decided that the best thing to do would be to take my brother and I to foster care. Um, Foster care, we were in there for three weeks. I don't really remember much from it. I remember it wasn't too good, it wasn't too bad. I do remember a funny story. It was 2012 when this happened, and if you remember, 2012 was the year the world was gonna end or whatever, and I went to school that day, and they were like, at 5.04, the world is ending, and I went home, and I was like, oh my God, I'm never gonna see my mom again. This is it, it's 5.03, I got 60 seconds to live, and then 5.04 hit, and the world kept on going, thank God. <laughs> After about three weeks, I was able to return home with Ali, and I was technically not allowed to be around my mom. And not too long after being home, my mom's court date came up, and the judge sentenced her to 20 do 5, which, if you don't know what that means, it's five years in prison, 20 years of probation mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, and that was the maximum sentence that she could have received. She was a first-time offender. The She was selling pills, which was wrong, but that was the utmost thing that the judge could have done. The plan when she went to prison was that I would continue to live with Ali in the house that I grew up in. But shortly after my mom went to jail, Ali found a new girlfriend and he decided to move in with her because he couldn't keep up with the bills in the house that we were currently living in. At that time I was 12, I was taking care of myself, my brother, the house, and I grew up fast. I had to do everything. And my life was about to drastically change again because I was going to move in with my dad. And at that point in life, I didn't hang out with my dad that much. He was here in and out a little bit, but I don't have very strong memories of being around him. Um, I was about, about four or five. He actually went to jail. And so I have two incarcerated parents. And if you let the world tell you something, I shouldn't be where I am today. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to live with my dad, it was fun. I got to be a little bit of a kid again. We lived on a lot of land. We had dirt bikes, four-wheelers, et cetera. But I lived in a house with my aunt, my, aunt, my two uncles, my great-grandmother, my cousin. It was a circus. <laughs> um, and the cool thing was that when I lived with my dad, I was actually able to go and my grandparents came and visited me a lot. And when they came to visit me, they would take me to go see my mom down in Swainsboro, which is hours and hours and hours away. Um, and one visit with my mom changed the trajectory of my life forever. While she was in jail, she began to get to know Jesus. She began to pray with people. She began to read her Bible. She began to do such amazing things. When I was a kid, we weren't Christians. Um, we might have said we were because we were born in the South. When you live in the South, you're just a Christian automatically. But we didn't even go to Christmas service. We weren't, no, we weren't anything. And... <laughs> When I visit her in the visitation center that one day, she asked me a fundamental question and she said, do you want to know Jesus and accept him into your heart? Yeah. Wow. And at that time I was 13 years old and I said yes. And she prayed with me. And I don't remember all the words that she said, but I remember the feeling that I got in my chest. And it was one of acceptance, one of love, one of grace, one of freedom. And I remember just bawling tears and them not being my own, but from the Lord 
allowing me into his family. So on July 27, 2013, I was welcomed into Christ's family. And on, on August 4, 2013, I was baptized and washed in my sins. And if you walk away forgetting my entire story, so be it. But this is the one thing that I want you to remember is that adversity is not the absence of God. In moments of adversity, we get to experience God in ways we never would have before. I'm going to say that again. In moments of adversity, I'm sorry, adversity is not the absence of God. In moments of adversity, we get to experience God in ways we never would have before. Amen. That was the most, yeah. <laughs> That was the most difficult situation I had ever been through in my whole life, yet I got to experience God and his love in a miraculous way. And that wasn't the only miracle Jesus performed. By the grace of God, my mom only served 15 months in prison. Mm. She got out and she was welcomed into my grandparents' home. And that doesn't happen for a lot of people. They don't get to get out and be welcomed somewhere, but she was. And the Lord provided her with a job, housing, and eventually she got me and my brother both back. She now has her own business, her own home, her own car, and her own newfound love of Jesus. She is walking proof that the Lord makes miracles out of mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord also provided for me in every way. In a season where it would have made perfect sense for me to quit and give up, God pushed me to keep fighting and keep going. In 2018, I graduated from Duluth High School with a 3.8 GPA, and yeah, <laughs> I did dual enrollment, so I went into college with a year's worth of credits, and that was a money saver, <laughs> especially because I went to UGA, Ooh. and I didn't want to go to UGA. I never wanted to go to a big school. I wasn't, honestly, Ali was a Florida fan, boo, and raised us, <laughs> raise us, boo. <laughs> and raise us to like the gators what a crazy thing i can't even imagine um <laughs> and so i but I, I remember hearing the lord's voice telling me to go because he had something for me there and so i went and from the moment i was 13 i wasn't this perfect great christian that did everything right but i knew when i got to college that i wanted to pursue jesus and so I joined a ministry called Wesley, and there I led a small group. I discipled girls. I became a part of a team that pursues God's heart for racial justice, and I just prayed, and I learned how to do it, and I learned how to hear God's voice, and I learned how to prophesy, and the Lord just taught me so much in my time at UGA. I recently graduated in May with my degree in elementary education, summa cum laude, <laughs> and it was just all the Lord in all honesty. I knew that the Lord has called me to stay at Wesley this year, so I decided to intern there. I have a flyer, I think a lot of you got it, that goes into detail about what I'll be doing, but the main things I'll be doing is I will disciple five to seven girls, and that looks like meeting with them one-on-one -on -one every week and just helping them walk in their faith, walk and point them towards Jesus. Um, I'll also be on the student experience team, which helps to welcome our 1,500 plus students into UGA, a lot of them being freshmen, a lot of them being sophomores that had that COVID year, and just giving them a place to call home. The current statistic right now is that one in every nine students are a part of the campus ministry overall, which is very small. That means there's eight students at UGA and one in every nine that don't know God or don't choose to pursue him in college. And my goal at Wesley is to change that. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the last thing I'm going to be involved in is the diversity outreach team, which I kind of mentioned a little bit before. But here we learn about other cultures and different ethnicities, and we discover what it means to pursue racial justice in a way that Jesus would have. And we try and create an environment where students of color can feel welcome and have a seat at the table. Because I walked into a, a school where it was predominantly white students, and I was the only person of color there. And coming from Gwinnett, that's not as... I, I went to Duluth, I, it wasn't like that for me. So then going into UGA and feeling unseen and unknown, I want to make people that look like me feel welcomed. Right. Yeah. So COVID made it so that people couldn't go to church and Satan tried to attack that. But like I said, adversity is not the absence of God. In moments of adversity, we get to experience God in new ways. And at Wesley, we are currently praying and believing for a revival in Athens that not only students, but also the city will see an uproar in believers. And that's a constant prayer that we've been having recently. I'm excited that God has chosen me to be a part of this, and I cannot wait to see what he'll do. I would love if you could partner with me in my mission in any way that you can. 
I and every staff member at Wesley live on support, so we're missionaries in Athens, essentially. Um, we need to raise money for gas, bills, rent, you know, adulting. I just learned out, found out what that was truly. Um, <laughs> and we have to raise, I, my goal right now is to raise $1,000 a month for that. I would also love to talk to you after the meeting, pray with you after the meeting, anything, whatever, if you want to know more about what I'm doing. God is doing big things, and I can't wait to experience him in ways I never had before. Thank you. <laughs>
and was pregnant and was considering having an abortion. Now we walk that out with someone, what that looks like. We don't refer out or, we provide, or provide those, but we will walk them through with a medical professional, what that looks like. We want them to be, be, be made aware of every available choice they have. We do it, we start at love well and we move up, mm -hmm. right? So it's not, a, it's not a coercive thing. It's not a, how dare you? Why would you do that? You're a terrible person. It is a, hey, we love you. No matter what you do, we love you. Yeah. We want you to know that we're a place you can always come back to. They're willing to hear about what it looks like to make an adoption plan. We're gonna talk about that with them, right? It's not giving up your child for adoption. You're making a brave choice. Mm -hmm. You're making a plan for your child to prosper and to thrive, right? It's, it's, it's awesome. If they wanna talk about parenting, we can talk about how we help them, what we can do, what our community around them can do for them. We're gonna do this in a fully holistic manner, knowing right if they're hungry, we might not be able to give them food, but we know who can. Yeah. If they're vulnerably housed, who, who can help them with that? We know who can do that, right? We point, they need some mental health services. We know who we can send them to. We're always continuing to find new and better places because people are always popping up, right? Gwinnett is big. Mm -hmm. uh, Gwinnett's becoming more diverse, which is amazing, which means that we also get better food and more diversity. I'm a, food is my thing. Um, but so I was telling you about this young woman come in, uh, ended up leaving us and had the abortion. And one of the things I say, if we can do two things well, we've done our job, if, if, especially if they're considering abortion, but no matter what, if we can make them aware of every available choice, if that's what they're looking for. But then no matter what they do, when they walk out those doors, we have loved them so well that they know, that they know they're always welcome back. This young lady comes back to us. She said, I'm really struggling because I had an abortion and, and it's hurting. Because here's the thing, right? She was young, maybe late teens, maybe 20, I, I don't know her age. But when they canceled the Olympics in 2020, she was going to the Olympics. She was representing the United States. And her thought was, if I'm pregnant, I can't compete. And that's a small window, right? It's not like curling, right? You can be 55 and be a curler. Um, right? Curling is like the most unathletic sport there is. It's fantastic. I could be a curler. It's awesome. Um, right, it's like curling, and I think the requirement is dad bod, right? You wear your arms out with a sweet yeah. You wear your arms yeah. out. <laughs> um, but as soon as she comes back to join our, our post-abortion support group, and she said, I, I gave up my baby. I, I had an abortion because I was going to be in the Olympics. And then they canceled the Olympics and it hit me. I don't have the Olympics. I don't have a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And w w when I talk to churches, when I talk to my own church, when I talk to churches and people get all angsty about this topic, and the church, I've said the church has done a great job at really getting women pregnant out of wedlock to one of two choices, public shame or private guilt, mm, right? Because right? it's what we do as a church. We're great at, you know, love everybody. Unless you're in church and you commit a sin, we're kicking you out. Right. You know, forgetting that when we were sinners, he loved us. Right. Put that out there. I think that's somewhere in that Bible thing. Uh, she came back and joined that, right? Because she knew that we loved her. She knew that we cared about her. That's what we do. We're here to love people. We're gonna care for them in whatever whatever stage of life they're in, whatever's going on, right? We've had trafficking victims come to us, and get rescued out of our clinic. If you don't, if you don't understand this, right, Gwinnett? I like the I like the music. I like this. this is, it was I like that. It was kind of it was kind of like it was like a building up. Like, all right, yeah. Um, you know, Gwinnett's prevalence for sex trafficking is, is tremendous. It's mm. ridiculous. Right, we, we lead out in our country, and in a lot of ways we lead out in the world with the Atlanta area and Gwinnett. Uh, if, you, if you don't know anything about Street Grace, go check them out, go through some of their trainings. I had my students the week before school start watch their sex trafficking 101 training, because kids need to know. Because mm -hmm. most children who get sex trafficked sleep in their own bed and go to school every day. Because right? if you're at school, right, you can recruit. Mm -hmm. You show up, you know, one day with that, very nice purse, nice clothes. Hey, how'd you get that? Right, and they walk through that. Street Grace will tell you too that, especially in the Southeast, if you land at a massage parlor that also doubles as a brothel, the vast majority of the time, they can trace it back where the epicenter is Duluth. Right, it's just down the road. Right, right Norcross Peace Street Corners. It's a hard prevalence mm -hmm. for Street Grace is based out of. If you're a trafficking victim, and you're stuck, right? And you're I mean, you're stuck. When you, if you think, wait a minute, why can't they get out? In the training that I did with my kids, they were talking about, they had a former 
trafficker who said he would, one of the ways that he would keep his girls subservient is he would only give them one roll of toilet paper for a week. And that's all they had. Somebody said, why? What is, what is that? He said, because if they can't, they can't figure out how to even get more toilet paper. They're never going to leave me. If you're being trafficked and you're pregnant and you can have an abortion before your pimp finds out, then that child's safe in your mind. Because the pimp wants that child for two reasons. Body parts or sex. You can sell them for body parts or you can sell them for sex. That's here. We get those victims. They come to us. If we, if we go through training to know what that looks like, so if we can identify that, and they'll self-admit, because it takes them saying, I'm being trafficked. That's only going to work if we're loving them. It's only going to work if they come in and know that that place, that place I'm safe. Yeah. That place they're not judging me. Right? When they come in, we don't, we don't blast them with, hey, you're here, you're pregnant, you know Jesus. We hit them, what we hit them with is, hey, you're pregnant, how's your life, what's going on? Hey, I love you. Maybe at the end of a visit, do you mind if I pray with you? Right, because most of our patients will self-identify as Christian. But if you if you guys remember church, like I remember church growing up, right? You didn't admit your sin in church. And people got mad at you. But if you come to a place that goes, wait a minute, you know my story? You hear what I've been through? You know the decisions I've made? You would have, you still want to love me? Right? Which is kind of what we talk about with Jesus. You know, you still want to love me? You still died? Like, it's been 2,000 years, but you still died? And we're doing our job. And that's what we're here for. We're here to be a light in the community. We're here to be a place that can love people no matter what. And it's hard. Or we get hard stories. But it's worth it. Right? Because if we know, we start every day with a devotion and we pray over each other with the recognition that, right, we could spend time not praying for each other. But if we're not lifting each other up, there's no way we're going to be able to be light for those that we see. So I'm going to pray real quick. And then we're going to clap for Sierra one more time. <laughs> and, then we're, and then we're going to like go full on go dogs. You want to call it off? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the light that is in this room. Because it's you. But everyone in here carries that with them. That when they walked in, there was light. When they leave, there's going to be light. But Lord, there are going to be times, like we all do, that we go through some darkness. Lord, like the patients that we see at Obria, like the students Sierra encounters, like the folks who have to live where Pamela is or where Paul is. Lord, we go through darkness. We go through pain. We think about where Brendan is, that, Lord, that he's in a place where people don't know you. Lord, I... I ask and I beg that all of us and everything that we do, that we show up and show out for you.